or actually what they say in Tahiti, it's manuad. So in Polynesian, there are actually many greetings and they never end, as you've seen. Uh, it's a very happy part of the world and I'm happy to be back on the ship where I come almost every year nowadays uh, and go to a place in the world where I had been previously many times and so I'm always happy to come back to Polynesia. Uh, and I, before I talk about that, I'd like to just say I'm here with my good friend uh, Julie Warden, who's a, my diving companion and a champion freestyle diver, by the way. And uh, so uh, we'll just have to uh, uh, go, go jump in the ocean yet again. We did yesterday. And I'm sure you've already had a lot of experience in Polynesia. Uh, this is, of course, a, a very uh, large part of the world. And Polynesia, as you know, it's Greek for the many islands. And it's referred to as also different from Melanesia, Micronesia, and these are terms that the European explorers gave to this area. Um, Melanesia being the darker people to the west, and Micronesia being uh, islands to the northwest of where we are. But Polynesia is its own cultural entity, but it's so vast. And it takes up uh, almost an immeasurable size of the world, larger than South America or North America, uh, maybe the size of uh, Africa even, some, some 200 million square miles of, of ocean with tens of thousands of islands spread, as one writer said, like stars on the, on the ocean. And so you have more islands than you'll ever be able to visit, and I'm going to show you the ones we've been to and a few that we'll never get to, just to give you a general sense of it. But uh, this is the Polynesian Triangle, so that you have the French Polynesian group uh, all the way down into the far right-hand side of Rapa Nui, or Easter Island, Pitcairn, uh, Rapa Nui being part of Chile, Pitcairn being a British uh, uh, territory, and then you have all the way up to Hawaii, then across to the, uh, what they call Kiribati, the many islands in northern Polynesia that are um, stretching across near the equator, then down into Tonga, Cook Islands, where we're going, and then, of course, the biggest of the Polynesian islands being Aotearoa or New Zealand. And this was a remarkable feat that people would come from, that's believed by DNA evidence, from Southeast Asia, mainly Taiwan, and further south of there, that started voyaging in ever larger canoes, and for about a thousand years settled all the way through various islands, came to the Cook Islands, and actually Rua Raiate is considered the home island of the culture because from there they went further south and further north to Hawaii and then all the way down to New Zealand. And uh, this is uh, quite a puzzle because the, the Polynesians were uh, traveling when Helen was uh, in Troy. This goes back into almost prehistory, and of course the, the people did not keep written records, but they kept a ver uh, an oral tradition of stories and historical memory, which has come down t to this day. And then archaeologists have been finding more and more of the early uh, buildings, marea, they call the foundations for uh, houses and also temples and ceremonial centers. And they, these have been found from the furthest outer islands in Hawaii all the way down to, of course, Rapa Nui. And then they found some on the South American coast now. And so now there's a lot of uh, scientific research to find out where people arrived when and how they were related back. And I'm actually a member of the Explorers Club um, preparing an expedition to an area in South Panama on the Pacific coast where we believe we will have DNA evidence of living Polynesians living on the coast of South America. And this will be news once the DNA analysis is done, if it's really true. And that's finally the, the uh, let's say, the extent of Polynesia will stretch all the way into some influence into ancient uh, Americas. Well, anyway, we're here in, in uh, French Polynesia, of course, with the five different major groups. We're in the Society Islands. And then there are more and more of them. That's uh, Tuamotu. Of uh, the um, Mar uh, Marquesas, what they say in French, the Ile, uh, Ile sous le vent and uh, Ile, Ile, Ile de vent, that's sort of leeward and windward islands, like you get in the Caribbean, where the trade winds are either coming directly at you or you're downwind of them, where there are other islands to windward. So this was a very uh, vast place. When the Europeans first came here, followed by whalers and other 
commercial interest. They were just amazed that there were people on all of these islands so far away. And I'm sure many of you have been to many of them already, but every time you come back to Polynesia, you're just um, in the world of the great uh, Moana Nui, the great ocean. And it's a part of the planet which is more, of course, water and a and an aquatic maritime tradition than, than a land-based tradition. And the Polynesian people moved out, going on to more islands with these great voyaging canoes. And again, Captain Cook and other explorers were just astonished at the ability of the Polynesians to travel and uh, navigate without any what would be called modern instrumentation. I have a whole training and uh, teaching in just the Polynesian navigation techniques, how to read the clouds and the of course, the stars, and then also how to read the water and follow birds. And so they were by far the world's greatest navigators to come and settle all of these places. And it was often done you know, by generations. They'd come to an island. They would bring their um, uh, 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 kamada, the sweet potato. They would cultivate crops. They'd catch fish. And then they would have a bountiful life on an island until they ended up having too, mon too many people. They started to have clan... Uh, disputes and then the, uh, the, re the result of any dispute was that uh, one group that was now going to go uh, away to found another island. So they spread slowly. So the question for the researchers is how, how many Polynesians did it take to settle on how many islands? And some of them have remains of settlements hundreds of years ago but they've since been abandoned and now the modern world has come in and made a great change, if you know the book, The, the Fatal Contact by Alan Moore, Moorhead, uh, relates the, the upsetting of the traditional culture and the changes. So I'll show you a little bit of it. But they still have the voyaging canoes. In fact, it's a great renaissance in the boat building and training of the traditional navigation te techniques of this day. But the first drawings of the visitors that came and were, were astonished by the Mare and the, and the uh, longhouse traditions, the, the great uh, tiki or totems of, of gods and ancestors. And so it's, it varies around the different parts of Polynesia, but this was a, an idyllic society that even Captain Cook said, these people do not need money, they don't need writing, they have a, a very healthy life, the, particularly the, compared to the scurvy sailors that came all the way from far away, the Polynesians are the epitome of a healthful society, and of course that led to the romanization of their society. But there were other troubles. There was fighting between them, ritualistic cannibalism. Uh, then there were, you know, the amazing sight of fully tattooed people, uh, which has returned as a tradition. It ended up being banned by the missionaries, and so there were generations without it. Now it's, of course, returned as a, a Polynesian gift to the rest of the world, uh, well, to some people. And then you had the uh, the family structure, which would be based on a, a clan uh, chieftain, which may be the woman. And this is a kind of curious thing about the uh, Polynesian society, that men and women were fairly equal depending on their abilities or their status with their family. And so there were many islands that had a, had a female uh, chief, the aoli the, is the word in, uh, in, in Tahitian for them and then would wage conflicts with often neighboring islands. So even just Tahiti alone of the society islands, the French Polynesia, had different groups on different islands that we visited. And uh, they were always asserting their authority, if they could, to the other islands. So when Cook came, uh, he was greeted by one group that would then want him to go help fight the other island. And so he, he did not want to get involved in that kind of trouble. But it was almost as if Pandora's box was opened by the European contact because all the troubles just kept going on. And meanwhile, this is one of Cook's own charts, they kept finding more and more islands. This is uh, Raitea and uh, Bora Bora there. And so the, just the cartography of knowing where these were and also the navigational ability to come and go in these islands was something that the Europeans got partly from the uh, Polynesians. This is um, Omai, the navigator that accompanied Captain Bly after his trip to bring breadfruit to Tahiti. And Omai had no, let's say, uh, cartography training, but he could verbally describe where everything was. And he would just point and say, this many days sail, you will find this island, and then you'll find that. So in his head, he had his own 
territorial knowledge of the whole ocean that he was part of. And so some uh, researchers again have said that this is a, an ability which humans have sort of like uh, some other birds and others, they'll have a sense of direction and they will be able to intuitively sense beyond what the indicators in the sky or the sea are. And in modern technology, especially now that we have a GPS and automatic this, that, and the other, we're losing that ability. And you may know that just because you can get lost and have to ask your phone, where am I, where am I going to go next? But the, the deep knowledge of this ocean was quite remarkable to the first visitors. And as the Europeans came, it became complicated because you had the competing European empires and then the Americans and then the Japanese and everybody over the last couple of centuries come to take a piece of Polynesia much to the, if not resistance, to the uh, dismay of many of the people in many of the islands. But when the, the contact happened, uh, there was a cultural clash. So this kind of a tiki god was sh uh, shocking to them, especially the missionaries. I don't know if the sailors were that upset by it, but the, when the missionaries came from all of the different countries, one of the first things they did is burn all of the tiki gods, tear down the temples, and this illustration you see the London Missionary Society uh, saying, and the idol shall be utterly abolished out of Isaiah. And here they are gathering all of the pagan ritualistic items to be burnt. Some of them ended up in museums. But well, there was a great cultural, I'd say, a, a genocide all through Polynesia because they were... They were no longer dancing naked. They were no longer tattooing. They were no longer worshiping the war god or the sea god. They had to convert to nominal Christianity. And in just Tahiti, the, the uh, contact meant that the, the uh, missionaries would force the clan leaders of the Queen Pomare, this is actually in Tahiti, to lead the people into the new faith. So that's where you see all of the different islands. You have all these churches and you have a very vibrant Christian culture. Um, the, the curiosity is, is that they're, they are Christian at first, but they don't actually follow many of the commandments, let's say. And so the, the women in particular uh, were forced to dress in what's the mumu or the full dress rather than in their previously, uh, let's say, better suited to the climate fashion. Um, but this goes on to the day, to, so that this sort of Victorian uh, dress took hold in um, Polynesia. Now it's, uh, if you went into this, in any of the towns like Papaete, we were amused by all the, the teenagers in ritualistic hip-hop clothing with curiously torn jeans. I don't know where that cult came from. Um, but here you have one of the Tahitian missionary women who helped convert the people and then the prime minister from uh, queen Pomare's uh, reign, and she was the last queen of, of uh, Tahiti and the neighboring islands. Uh, and her palace is right downtown, but it, it, it was um, built actually by the French for her. And now it's been converted. One, one part of it's historical, but it's on the, the, on the grounds is the parliament and the uh, government offices for French Polynesia. And the, but behind in, in the garden, there is her her bathing stream and a bath where they cut out of rock and there's a beautiful pool for swimming, which is uh, in tribute to her, that was her home. The family is uh, no longer, uh, let's say, in charge. They mixed in with the, the rest of the population. So there is no more royalty or monarchy in Tahiti. Now there is in Tonga, that's the last of the, of the kingdom monarchies in, in this area. Uh, but the people endure, and the, the health of, the, of them has uh, been impacted by more different food, sugar and candies and other kinds of food, the, so that there are health problems related to the variety of uh, things that are available, but that's common around the world now. But for, you know, some of the traditions have continued to come back, like the tattooing, the uh, dances, and the exuberance of the people, which had been pretty much suppressed a few hundred years ago has come back in what's been called the Polynesian Renaissance, a cultural pride that was not tolerated as much in the previous centuries. And so some of the, uh, the uh, dances have been recreated, the um, ceremonial warfare is reenacted in places, and so it's, a, it's a very much a vibrant place and probably more interesting now than it may have been uh, back when 
uh, the missionaries were running the, the uh, culture, let's say. And this is primarily led by um, the, the indigenous desire, but this particular movie, if you haven't seen it, became extremely popular in Polynesia, of course, and they dubbed it into Maori and Hawaiian and Tahitian. I mean, the, the languages are very similar, but the, the, the detail is quite different. So this has meant that a whole new generation has uh, had this, uh, uh, let's say, celebration, of, particularly of, uh, this is Maui, the, uh, the demigod of the sea, and the heroine of the movie is the young woman who becomes a navigator, and they go off fighting monsters in the Disney style. And some people have said, well, you're making cartoon caricatures of, of, of these people. Um, but the story is very positive. Of course, Disney makes cartoons out of everybody. Not, not anybody in the room here, though, I hope. But, but that, that's a palpable difference from when I first came to this area maybe 20 years ago. And now there's a lot of uh, a resurgence of traditions and pride and, uh, in fact, some belligerence, let's say, because there's always been an element that wanted to kick out all of the foreigners, particularly the French and Polynesia, and make a Polynesian nation, except it's so far and so, uh, uh, you know, little bits of land, it's very hard to make a united nation out of so many places. So now there are these different subgroups in Polynesia that, um, and different islands that more or less stay fairly independent, but mainly because they're so far away from each other. So this is one north of um, Tahiti. I don't know if we've You've been here on another trip, Fakarava, which is a classic atoll with this great fringing reef. And so many of them look very similar, but the remarkable thing is about these islands is they are, they are usually a volcanic rise that gets a, a coral reef around it. Then the volcano subsides and sinks back in the ocean, but then there's this beautiful salt lake in the middle of them. And this is, I'll talk uh, in a few more days about just the oceanography and geography, geology of the Pacific and Polynesia. But when you go any of these islands, you'll see um, the efforts to make it part of a larger economy. This is the old lighthouse. And once the Europeans came, they had sail ships and they took over the trade. Actually, the, they banned the native voyaging because they wanted to control the trade between the islands. And so you have the remains of that kind of colonial effort. Um, but of course, in our modern time, it's turned into tourism and resorts and things. So even the faraway islands often have some bit of services for visitors. Uh, whether they have a dock or not, or a gap in the atoll is what usually determines whether people can get there, or an airstrip. So you may think that uh, the islands we were were maybe a little crowded. Well, there, there's many, many more. Uh, yesterday, we asked our dive master where where he liked to go diving the most, and he, his answer is, there's so many islands, you'll, you, you can't live long enough to experience them all. And so this is why it's sort of the, uh, more than Polynesia, it's almost an uh, endless expanse of different islands. There may be you know, 10 to 20,000, depending on what you count, what's above sea level. And some of them have active um, production of pearls and then seaweed and, uh, of course, the uh, fishing resources. Um, m most of them are self-sustaining until they build a town as big as Papaete, and then they have to import some of their food. And the other issue I'll talk about another day is about the territorial, territorial fishing rights. But just on the very islands themselves, there's plenty of uh, opportunity to go out fishing, and uh, the, the sea is bountiful here. It's out in the major ocean that they've been taking away the larger tuna and the other uh, pelagic fish. But I'm sure you've going out snorkeling or seeing some of this. So this is your typical uh, scenery with all of the turtles. We saw a sea turtle yesterday. And uh, so some of these islands, they are actually now marine refuges because of the taking of wildlife out in the larger ocean. So it's only in the, in the preserves and where people come to go swimming that they, were, they, they have a no-take zone and they protect even these big uh, this is a uh, rats. We saw one like this yesterday that they called Napoleon, and he was this big. Of course, my arms aren't big enough for a good fish story. It was actually that big. And when it saw us, he said, oh, no, we, we're small fry. Anyway, but you can go down and see you know, the endless variety of all the fish and the look in the eels. Uh, one of our fellow divers took a picture of, a, of one of these flaming newbie branch swimming worms, which are 
quite remarkable. And then all of the parrotfish and the butterfly fish and the snappers and et cetera, et cetera. You can, if you, if you don't go diving, uh, you can see it snorkeling. You can see much. But we were diving off of a, of a place off the outer reef where the boat was surrounded by sharks. <clears throat> Just a, the welcoming committee, that's what we were told. Uh, they, these are black tip sharks and they they are just sort of patrolling the area, but they are not dangerous, and they'll just come up to you and stare you in the, in the face. Um, other places have bigger ones, and of course there are uh, great whites and others out in the bigger ocean, but this is reef sharks and local feeding and, and reproduction. This is a hammerhead, which are also not dangerous to humans. And uh, another time I was here, we went swimming with the, the manta rays, which with a little bit of chum, you could feed them, they'll come up and kind of nuzzle. It's a, it's a little strange. It feels like you're playing with an alien. But you never know what kind of strange creatures you'll find out there. But uh, it's real, I tell you. <clears throat> but then I'm back on shore. You have people who are living in a fairly subsistence way. They grow some food. They go fishing. And um, it's a extremely pleasant lifestyle compared to the, the manic life of big urban cities in some places. I live on a... a what I call the topical island of Manhattan. So I can't complain about crowds, except you come out here and you see that there really is a, a different way to live, which maybe the locals are, you know, they'd like to go out and see the world too, but I've, I've talked to some various Tahitians and Maori and others say they, they have had the opportunity to go around the world, particularly from French Polynesia, they get educational opportunities in France and they're full French citizens, but they usually say, well, we've had enough of that cold, wet, cynical place, we want to be back home. And so what's happened, of course, is a lot of these islands have been developed for tourism, so the employment for many people is servicing the visitors in these beautiful traditional style housing and things. So you, you, you no doubt have been to some of these places, but you know, the, the ideal is you're you know, a bed with an ocean view. And so particularly French Polynesia is pretty expensive that way, but all through Polynesia you just have this beautiful seascapes, landscape, flowers, and as I say, a, a, a Polynesian woman is not dressed till she has a flower at her ear. Oh, the ginger, I mean, I just have pictures of it, but you can go out and look at all this stuff uh, yourself, the mimosa tree. And then more islands. This is the Tuamotos, and the ship came past them. And, uh, but again, if you want to stop and visit them, there are so many. These are all low islands. They're no, not mountainous like the Marquesas or Fiji and, or even Bora Bora where we were. But again, you have reefs that are uh, rimmed around a vast lagoon. This is one of the largest, Rangaroa, which is a beautiful place because the, the quality of the, the, the vast sea lake is, is uh, sort of very radiant. And it has very small strips of land and actually very few people live on it. And we stopped there once a few years ago and it sort of has this vast quality that uh, uh, it's uh, so some of it is like the, once you've seen the broadness of the Pacific, uh, every other sea is a bit of a lake even if they're not near land. And then there's the life of the surf and the weather and I'm, I'm going to talk about that more later but we've seen this just on our trip, you, the weather will change within an hour and you'll be soaked and then it'll be sunny again and it'll come again and, and that's a meteorological function of the of the broader Pacific. And so, but people have spread out and set up their communities and uh, it's uh, isolated existence um, for many and uh, one of the troubles they have these days is that uh, because of modern communications they know about the rest of the world. They do get a phone service sometimes. When I was up in an island in Kiribati north of Tahiti on the way to Hawaii uh, and we stopped at uh, a small island that had not had anybody visited in two years. And the elders were telling us that they used to have a British school teacher, a foreign missionary would come, and then they had a U.S. Army air base, and before that they had whalers, and they had connection to the world. But nowadays they see the airplanes up in the sky flying over them, and nobody stops her. So they they lined up all the children, hundreds of children, just to look at us because they hadn't seen a stranger before. Well, that's the life, and of course, the one they get the, 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 you know, the knowledge that there are all these other possibilities in the world. Some of them feel, well, we're lucky to be here, but others feel you know, a, a bit uh, too isolated for their own good. 
So this is uh, actually in Rangaroa, just the, the, the newer houses in concrete and streets and telephone lines. So this has changed the life of the, of the people quite a bit. But again, there's a, the usual uh, growth of the population presses on the um, resources and some of them have to, again, import food and they have a life that is sort of tenuous if comfortable. Um, and so this is just sort of... Uh, something they made in, the, in one of their yards, a curious modern sculpture out of uh, driftwood. But they will pass their life and have their generations in very solid uh, family life. Um, and they are, uh, let's say, very affectionate and devoted to their family and, and uh, respectful of their elders and things that um, some places uh, we don't have so much of anymore. But uh, again, you have the, the sea and the other islands. Of course, we've been to Tahiti, Mar uh, uh, Borobor on the last cruise, the Rayate, we were just there at Ta'aha. And uh, depending on if you were there ashore, you know, many of them will seem quite similar, um, particularly these mountainous ones, which still have the, the remnants of the volcano and then the, the fringing reef and the way in. And uh, this is Mo uh, Morea, which is the first island out of Tahiti. We went past it in the rain and in the dark. Um, I don't think uh, the ship landed there this time. But it is uh, v versus. Uh, Tahiti, it's not as developed, but, it, but the development it does have are mostly resorts. And uh, this is a, always an issue whether they'll allow more building and higher development considering the demand on the resources. But this is now the, the, the life of many of these islands. When, if they are developed for tourism, that's where the economy tends to, in, in addition to their agriculture or whatever fishing they might do. And so you have visitors, which are sometimes sort of welcome, but other times they are resented because they either take the prime waterfront, or in this case, I don't know if anybody can read the uh, Tahitian here. I, bel I was told it says, these are my coconuts, go get your own. <laughs> well, but uh, it's uh, inland, it gets to be um, a rainforest jungle that much of it has been cleared for pineapple, sugarcane, other crops like that. So Morea has a whole central valley, if you've been up in there, which is full of agriculture, mainly for the markets in Papaete. And in the, in the woods uh, and up the hills and certain overlooks and in places there are the remains of the Morea, the ceremonial uh, platforms from the previous religion. Um, the biggest one of all is in uh, Raetea, the mother Morea, they call it, where um, it's on the south coast of Aretea, but uh, in the settlement of other Polynesian islands, they would take a stone from that temple mount, they put it in the canoe, and then they would go off and use it as the first stone in a new Mare temple on a new island. And so this is a, a curious uh, culture that the, 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 the stones were actually holy, and they put it in the center of the canoe, and for months they'd go out until they decided where they're going to build another one. So that's the tradition. But they're still out there in the woods. Uh, some of them have been rebuilt with some structures on them, but most of them are just an a sacred place and they're not to be disturbed and they have the old carvings of the various gods and uh, some of them have been brought down to more public places. But uh, many of them were destroyed, but now they're carving new ones. and. Now it has become a kind of a tourist trade to have everybody, you'll get your very own tiki god for good luck. And some of them kind of venture into almost to modernist art. Well, of course, the European and other artists were greatly influenced by these kind of imagery back, Picasso, etc. cetera. Uh, but again, the contact meant new problems. Now this is uh, a picture I found in, or a poster I found in Morea about that still they have trouble with malaria, dengue fever, and AIDS and things like this that have brought, been brought in, but this is probably the worst, alcohol. And so the local people are, you know, encouraged to stay healthy. They're in a healthy environment with a healthy food, usually. And, uh, but, you know, the modern society is still a bit of an affront to the traditions and then even, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the culture here. This is on uh, Morea, one of the, the eight-sided church and with the canoes out front. And of course, we were just in Tahiti. This is a, now we've already been back from there. And Papeete is certainly the center of all of uh, uh, French Polynesia. And, and many people say that's such a big city and too crowded and too noisy. Well, again, it's a your matter of your relative interest, but uh, it's the important commercial and political center of 
the country, and you will see the French flag f flying proudly, but France and Polynesia have had a, a difficult relationship because of the nuclear testing down the Gambia Islands. And ever since that happened, there was such anger in Polynesia that the French government under uh, Giscard d'Estaing uh, agreed to subsidize Polynesia and to make sure that it had new roads and free education and medical care and things like that. And so a, a friend told me that, uh, true or not, that if you are in uh, uh, Polynesian and French Polynesia and you want to get a truck for your business or for, your, for yourself or get a car, you can apply and you'll get a free loan and they'll give you your car, and then if you apply again, the, uh, the government authorities will forgive the debt. So that's sort of a subsidy at that level even. And so this is the Polynesian fl flag, you may have seen, the French Polynesian flag, which they, they, they didn't really include the, uh, the tricolor in it, but anywhere, there's the voyaging canoe in the center of the consciousness of the culture of the people. Well, Papayete, we were just there, so I won't go on about it, but it has its main road, and the road goes all the way around the island. There's not much that goes up the hill very far. So this is what creates a bit of congestion, especially in Papayete, as this commercial center with that. If you went to the great Marché Municipal and saw all the, the products that come in from all over French Polynesia, and they have their own money. You may have seen these beautiful coins of the Polynesian franc. Uh, they don't use the euro, even though they are part of the European Union. And then there are other communities. The Chinese community, I note this, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Tong House there with the emblem of the nationalist uh, Chinese. Uh, another issue is the other political relations, but I'll go on to that another day. Then if you didn't go see uh, Matavai Bay, where uh, Captain Cook came and settled and did his observations of... Uh, the transit of Venus. Uh, this is a beautiful park that's just south of the main city uh, with a lighthouse and then memorials to, for instance, uh, the Bounty, which came here and stayed in the bay. And it's a beautiful park. and It's usually people on a tour will go there. And then out there in the bay, which is a very calm side of the island, you have um, kids learning how to sail and swim. And uh, it's a beautiful place, unlike the center of Papaete. But this is a a sign I took up there, Mon spot c'est pas le boubelle. This is my place, don't make, make it full of trash. And also, if you're, if you're going to surf today, you should clean, uh, surf tomorrow, you should clean up today. Well, and the island is, you know, big and has these beautiful DNA and the diamond mountains up on the very peaks of it, which are not easy to get up to. But that's the, the home of the gods in Tahiti, traditionally, the island of Tahiti. And then they would give their blessings of fresh water come right down to the shore. And, of course, this climate means you get a, plenty of rain and there's always plenty of water. And uh, uh, it's a, a very, um, I'd say, a healthy place. You could take an outdoor shower in, in many a place. And you were here, as you can come approaching right from last night. This is Bora Bora. And I think I heard last week that when you went there, it was raining and you didn't get a good view. Um, but anyway, this is what it looks like on a nice day. It's been called the world's most beautiful island, but that's a, there are a lot of competitors in this part of the world. And it, it was not really accessible until on the top side of the picture, there was a big cut put through the reef by the U.S. Navy to make it a Navy base in World War II. And so at one point, they came and blasted the reef away, and that's why ships of, of certain size can get in there and anchor, and then they also have an air port so that this island has again become very well developed and so you have all these luxury resorts all around the reef and um, it's become a, perhaps a victim of its own fame that uh, it's uh, particularly expensive and sort of crowded in the center uh, towns there. But if you get out on the reef it's a beautiful place with all the uh, outlying motu they call them, the, the little islands that are in the lagoon and on the shore and so this is again beautiful snorkeling and diving. And uh, it's, it's a very happy island because everybody's going there for the pleasure of it, which is in the beauty of it. And here's a view from up on the higher peak, but many, many of the developments are out on the outer ranges and the, the interior is left as a natural preserve, particularly so they'll have fresh water all the time. And so the views go on. I, I've uh, been there myself a number of times and you know, this is sort of the place you just don't want to go back home, but uh, 
it's, it's a very uh, rugged island, so there are hiking trails up to a place where there was a gun emplacement back in World War II, and that's one of the things you can do right up on the in a four-wheel drive to get up on those peaks and see the whole um, island. Again, the Catholic church down in the town and some auberge sort of simple housing to match the overly uh, developed, uh, perhaps, uh, meridians and fancy hotels and resorts. But the, um, you know, this is the road up to the uh, top of the mountain where the guns were placed in World War II. Uh, but the, they, there never was any fighting right here. This is, was a base that meant that the forces moved further to the west where the battles were. So Bora Bora and Tahiti were never affected by World War II. But they are certainly affected by this kind of development. You see, the, this is the iconic uh, resort uh, bungalows out over the water. I don't know if anybody's uh, had a recent honeymoon to go out there, but they're about 1,000 euros a night to be out there over the water and uh, have your your special time and uh, and this is uh, of course why why France doesn't want to give up French Polynesia because of uh, romance which is a national policy of France excuse me if there are any French in the audience but anyway that's where Bora Bora and Tahiti will always be probably part of France just because they want to have a place sort of the last bit of empire that is so beautiful, they, they'll do anything to keep it. But we'll see. I, ha I had a friend who was an anthropologist, and he was stopped in Papaete by the French Secret Service to see whether he was organizing a rebellion. And he lived on an outer island, but he was an academic, and he had been going around so long, and he answered the police. He said, Polynesian people are much too kind and generous to have a political revolution because they may talk and complain a bit about being part of the French nation, but basically they're not going to have an uprising because it's uh, the weather's too nice. You know. <laughs> anyway, there are all these other beautiful places. This is an island just north of Tahiti, which is where Marlon Brando moved and had a house in his later years. Now it's a a, a resort, but uh, it it is. There have been proposals to develop this and other atolls so that they will take the pressure of tourism and development away from the developed places already and build artificial islands, reefs, and or what they call the sea, sea steading, new communities out either floating or built up on a reef that will then take mass tourism either off of ships or airports. And this is these are projections, and I don't think they're going to happen because either of sea level rise or just engineering problems. But there have been many uh, conception about how do you have a, uh, communities that are out away from the troubles of the world and have maybe floating gardens and things like this. But this may, may be the future, but uh, I don't know because uh, uh, it kind of takes away a bit of the charm of, of Polynesia to be living in a bubble like that, but we'll see. Anyway, I'm going to go on. Uh, until my end here, I'll just show you a bit of the Cook Islands, which are an independent country. They were granted their independence from the UK in a, so that they would be in association with New Zealand. So they have their own um, flag, which curiously has what looks like the EU symbol on the Union Jack. I don't know if they're going to change it. And the Cook Islands have uh, they've been called the, uh, uh, the more natural and undeveloped counterpart to Tahiti right across the sea. And we'll see that it doesn't quite have the, the uh, development that uh, the, t the society of Tahitian islands have. Uh, but there again, there are about 15 major islands grouped to the north, grouped to the south. Uh, many a little island, this is called Puka Puka, which looks like some sort of a, uh, a creature, but it's actually an atoll with a spit. And then there are other ones that are almost rectangular as a um, as an island. Uh, again, most of them don't have much development, so the budget travelers and others often go to the Cook Islands because it's not uh, as expensive as uh, French Polynesia. And there's, again, plenty of islands. This one is quite remarkable with its sort of mouth opened into the lagoon. But we're going to Rorotonga, which is the main island that has an airport and uh, the main political commercial center on Rorotonga, which is again a high volcanic island and a ring road and then reefs around it. Um, and we will be landing at the capital 
in Avarua, which is, a, again, a, sort of a one main road and a little bit of an upland, a market right there. We'll be, we'll be docking right onto the left side of the, of the map there. And it's a very simple uh, town. Uh, but it has a bit of a uh, troubled history uh, in that the, the, when the French and the British and the Germans and then even the Americans were competing on who was going to control these islands, uh, the Cook, Cook Islands, part of them were claimed by American Samoa. It was only in 1990 they finally made an agreement that they would, they would not dispute the Cook Islanders' claim of a number of northern islands in the group. Uh, but going back even further, they had a, a, a problem of the Peruvian guano trade sent ships to capture labor and what they call the blackbirders would come and they would enslave the Cook Islanders. And the, the Royal Navy at the time had a mission to stop slavery. And so they came in and they took the islands to protect the people and then they made the queen uh, in charge. But uh, it's since gotten its independence. It has its uh, relations. Uh, they even welcome tourists like Hillary Clinton. She needed a day off. But again, it's part of the larger uh, canoes uh, culture and the resort culture, and it's, uh, again, a similar place, but it's beautiful and a little more simple and a little more quiet. So I'm going to leave you with one last uh, saying, which is actually a Polynesian sea chant. When you're out in your canoe voyaging, you, you will say, let the calm be widespread, and let the sea glisten like green jade, and let the shimmering warmth of the eternal summer ever dance across your sea path. And with that, I wish you a bon voyage. It's my pleasure to be aboard with you. Thank you very much. <laughs>